Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. Uh, we are here together with Chance Capital, we being London School of Business and Finance Executive Education, uh, to bring you a very special webinar with Hugo Chance, who is our second speaker in the series of webinars we've started since last month. and. Today, the topic will be how to successfully raise capital for your business. Um, before we get started, please use the chat function to let us know that you can hear us. And uh, please let us know where you're listening from. It will be good to know uh, what your background is or maybe even why you're interested in this topic for us to uh, just to get to know you a little better. So uh, use the chat function and we will be able to see your comments as the webinar goes. Uh, we've been experiencing a little bit of technical issues before we started. So if anything happens during the webinar and you lose connectivity, just press the link again and you will be able to come back inside. But hopefully there will be uh, no issues. Uh, hopefully, um, the, the platform has resolved that. So, we have a few of you answering. Uh, I think I can see we have people from the UK and where else do we have? Let us know where you're listening from. It will be good to know. Uh, so that we can even maybe talk about some of the um, areas that you would be particularly interested. So today's webinar um, will have a question and answer type of format where I will be asking Hugo questions around raising finance for business. And uh, if you have questions, by all means, put them into the chat and then we will find the appropriate time to address your questions as well. It will be uh, interesting for, for us to know what you guys think. Uh, I will do a very brief introduction to Hugo and I'll let him talk uh, a little bit more about his background. But uh, Hugo has been working with London School of Business and Finance um, for, for a little while now. Uh, bringing together topics around venture capital and investment in small businesses. Um, not even small in, in businesses in general. Uh, so before we get started, uh, I'd like to just bring to your attention um, a very uh, brief statistic around what venture capital is all about. So these um, slide just gives you a bit of a background of who we are um, but more importantly I'd like you to um, look at these very brief statistics for your attention before we get started with the topic. Um, in the UK last year there were reported to, to be 824 venture capital firms and in the US there was more than a thousand and that is a large number considering that the global investment in startups last year was 254 billion investing in around 18,000 startups. Um, as you can see, invest, a single investment fund is in the millions and uh, it, they invest in various companies with, from various industries. So, Venture capital is a very interesting uh, topic that anyone who is running a business that has the aspiration to grow needs to understand. And uh, the reason that is because a lot of SMEs fail. We know that. You know, what is the statistic? We will probably find out later. But the main reasons, as identified by surveys, are number one, no market need. So investors have uh, or entrepreneurs have not made their um, research as to where exactly they should open uh, their business. But what's more important today is that the second largest reason 
SMEs fail is because they run out of cash. They hadn't looked at the finances well enough to prepare for the tough times at the beginning of running a business. And this is where the advice from Hugo Chance is extremely important because you can avoid this particular failure by having a robust plan from the beginning and understanding of where your options are. And the statistic gives you some other reasons why um, SMEs fail, but they're of a smaller percentage um, from the survey that, that we have um, found out for you. So at this point, I would like to um, hand over to um, Hugo and I would like um, to switch my slides. Just give me a moment. Uh, where is, ah, here we go. Maybe not. Are you, we seeing the right slides, Hugo? Yes. Great. So can I hand over to you to do a brief introduction about yourself and Chance Capital, and then we can delve right in. Fantastic. Hopefully you can hear me clearly. Um, and thank you for having me to speak on the webinar. Um, so as Desi said, my name is Hugo Chance. I run a, a corporate broking firm called Chance Capital. Um, in terms of background, I've been involved in venture capital for the last uh, 10 years, just over 10 years, uh, initially working with startup businesses, uh, running um, pitches for angel investors. And then I moved on to work for a boutique investment bank um, where I assisted in the um, fundraising for private businesses and businesses which went on to float onto the stock market, typically onto the uh, AIM market here in London. Um, so I ran their family office um, for a number of years. And after that, I've always wanted to start my own business. So I started Chance Capital um, around four years ago. Um, one of the first things I did was make sure that we um, were covered um, as an appointed representative under the FCA. So we, we, we are uh, umbrella <laughs> under the Caribbean for that purpose. And that allows us to um, work with equity investors as well as debt investors for SMEs, for small and medium sized enterprises that are looking to raise typically somewhere between one and 50 million. Um, I think that's that's us in a nutshell. Great, thank you very much. I think um, we can uh, delve right in. So just to start the discussion, can you please give us a little bit of a background of um, or briefly outline for us, what is the investor ecosystem and um, at the seed stage of venture capital within the UK, what should we know about it? Sure. And maybe if we if we um, flick onto the first slide, um, I think it arguably this is perhaps the hardest time to raise capital. Um, there are all sorts of challenges. Um, but really the the ecosystem that you are faced with in terms of investors are at the pre-seed stage and you can see on the slide are um what's often referred to as the three f's fr friends families and fools um it's a bit harsh because fools because most people uh, unfortunately lose their money um uh, but nonetheless of course every business has to start somewhere and um, going cap in hand to raise um, a relatively small amount of money from your friends and family is usually for many businesses and people the first stop in their fundraising journey. So friends and family and uh, angel investors. So angel investors, the term you may hear quite regularly, are very often high net worth individuals who um, have enough capital to invest in early stage businesses. Um, again, looking at the slide, you can get a feel for the, the, the quantums of the size of checks that they're able to cut into um, pre-seed or seed uh, plus level businesses. Um, alongside individual angels are angel funds. So these are funds which are set up uh, by a fund manager and they collate and collect capital from a whole range of 
individual high net worth angel investors and they will uh, invest that capital into startup businesses um, that they think are interesting and, and have a good chance of success. And then lastly, you have, uh, sorry, um, two more, you have crowdfunding sites, which again, you may well have heard of. Um, some like these, some don't. Um, I have a healthy skepticism of them for, for reasons I won't go into quite yet. Uh, they can provide access to rapid capital. Um, they come with relatively high fees, but th this is where you put your business onto a website for retail investors to view your proposition. So it's very public, almost like a, an IPO. And you're, you're hoping to get, you know, let's say you're raising half a million pounds. It allows anyone in, frankly, in the world to invest typically anything as little as 10 pounds. Um, obviously what you then might end up with is a long, long list of uh, retail investors or small, smaller investors. Um, that may, may or may not suit you, but it is an option. And the last of those groups is uh, family offices. So families who obviously have capital to deploy, much like a high net worth individual. Uh, this is not typically the stage that a institutional venture capital uh, firm or private equity firm would get involved. Typically, those guys um, like to see businesses, excuse me, that are turning over north of five million pounds plus. So obviously, we are really, I think today, majoring on that seed or early startup stage business. So those really are the, the, are the groups that you, you want to identify. So it seems to me that it's really important to find the right investor for the right stage. Um, how do you find these right investors for your business? Mm. Well, it's, again, this is, this is arguably the most critical stage because you are at that um, very beginning starting post of trying to find someone, uh, let's say it's an individual. Um, it's as much a business transaction as it is a uh, relationship with that person that you have to frankly get on with them as a human being and you need to make sure ideally that they're going to bring strategic value to your business so you need to understand um, perhaps what they've invested in the past similarly they're going to obviously do their due diligence on you as an individual as a business but it's absolutely paramount paramount that um, you get on with them frankly and that they are going to ideally add some value to the business um, because they may well be with you for you know at least two three years before the business starts to <clears throat> pick up some traction and, and and hopefully make some good profits so this is not at startup stage typically a stage where an investor is looking for a quick win where they can put in x amount of money and then sell their shares a year a year later because typically it takes startups um, several years to really break even and get going. But it is absolutely all important that um, finding that right investor, um, wherever it may be, is, uh, is done correctly and in the right way. And of course, there's the whole then question of um, how much equity you give away, and we'll, we'll I'm sure, come into that um, afterwards. Um, I think the other thing to, to, to point out just on this is um, you need to be open to listening to seasoned investors. You know, a lot of these guys have invested in a number of early stage businesses before and uh, they know what they're talking about. And I think it's a very good sign for an investor if you have um, humility to listen to them, listen to their experience. Uh, and and then similarly, it's a red flag to investors. It's called founders mentality often, where an investor thinks it's my business, I know best. Um, and they don't listen to even suggestions from investors. So I think humility at that stage to listen, to digest what some of these investors have uh, might recommend is, is always a very good sign. Bearing in mind that unfortunately, it's not a very cheery statistic, but um, I believe 90% of all startups ultimately fail, which um, can be down to a whole number of reasons, lack of you know, access to capital, et cetera. Uh, and I think Desi touched on one or two of the other reasons at the beginning of the webinar. So um, 
looping back, it, it, it's really, really important to find the right investor. And I would always advise, um, rather than just taking any capital, um, holding out for that right investor, because again, it is a relationship and, it, and it's likely to go on um, for, for many years to come. Thank you. So let's say um, a business is ready to start um, seed stage financing. How do you uh, suggest the business prepares for this and what are the options? Sure. I think if we can um, flip onto slide three, um, I, I very often say to clients, and I, and I know it's, a kind of, it's an old saying, but um, fail to prepare, prepare to fail is, 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 is not a bad mantra when it comes to this, this, uh, this whole process. Um, it really is that opportunity and the first time that any business will get to um, to profile not only themselves, their management team, but the business and to come across in a compelling and incredible way. And I think that preparedness is absolutely key. Um, if you go into a meeting and you're slightly, um, you know, you know, flying along and thinking you can just charm them, it's, you know, most of the time it's not going to work especially with any seasoned investor who's done this before, they're going to really scrutinize all of your financials, um, you know, who your competitors are, um, all of the metrics that any uh, professional investor would look for, you need to be prepared. And if you don't know the answers, and many people watching may have seen Dragon's Den or Shark Tank, where it's slightly more theatrical than the real thing, but nonetheless, the, the message is, rings true you have to be prepared because if they find an area that you're not prepared, they'll dig into it and they're looking for a reason to invest, but also not to invest. If they can suss out that you are, you know, you don't know what you're talking about, or you have prepared your financials properly or whatever it may be, then it's not gonna look good. And ultimately you may, um, you, you, you may not get capital from that person. So I think that's uh, that's that's really important. There are a few tips, and there are there, there are some practical things you can do um, to to prepare to offset that risk. Um, one of them is, of course, speaking to other founders who have been through the process before, asking them, you know, what how they found it, um, you know, what are the pitfalls. Um, I think the tricky thing here also is nearly every single investor. Will have a slightly different approach to that process and we'll come on to this in a bit but i think um generally speaking nowadays unless you're at a later stage business it's more of a conversational approach um, certainly in the first instance where um the fund or the individual wants to get to know you um wants to see if you're credible and have the passion and enthusiasm for your business as well as the knowledge and preparedness for it um, so I think speak to other people, uh, speak to other founders, um, be clued up on things like tax incentives. Um, we'll come on shortly to things like SEIS and EIS. Um, and also just be mindful that this is not a process which is going to happen overnight. Raising capital always takes longer than um, you might imagine. And so it's being prepared that this is going to take you away, even at early stage, it's going to take you away from the running of the business um, and it, it's almost like a job in itself raising capital um, you can of course retain advisors like chance capital uh, but very often at that early stage at seed stage businesses don't have the the revenues or the capital to to retain advisors so they have to do it off their own bat um, and i think it's 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 really worthwhile keeping in mind that there is a time resource as a time cost to raise that capital. Um, you know, the number of times I speak to businesses who are frustrated because they just didn't think that they would still be cap in hand trying to raise, you know, a couple hundred thousand um, six months down the line, they thought it will be done within a month is, you know, it's countless. So it just be mindful of the fact that it, it does take a while, it can take a while. Um, and I think just most of all, it's it's the passion for the business. It's so important. Um, and again, this is probably the fundamental difference between raising 
capital on a crowdfunding campaign where it's all digital and you can pop in the business plan and maybe a video, but there's very little, if any, in fact, probably zero physical interaction with you, an investor. Um, you know, the model that we run is we introduce people face to face, you know, over a coffee. It's fairly, um, fairly, fairly informal initially, but it's really seeing the whites of the eyes and that allows an investor, especially if they're putting in, you know, a large amount of money to see whether they like you and vice versa, whether you are credible and whether you have passion in the business, whether you are enthusiastic. Um, and I, I cannot emphasize how important it is to obviously know your stuff, but have the enthusiasm and have that kind of that determination and grit to, to deliver and to, to, to really kind of go above and beyond to make, uh, make the business succeed and obviously to make some profit for, for the shareholders. Passion for the business is definitely one of the magic ingredients uh, that, that, that we really need to see for it to succeed. So you briefly mentioned um, about the process um, in your answer. I'm interested to know what investors look for. What is the process and how do you prepare your business to stand, to stand out from the rest? Uh, what uh, shall we do as steps? Sure. Thank you for, for switching slides. So you can hear, see here, this is quite a typical venture capital process, more of an institutional approach, but nonetheless, <clears throat> it serves to give you an idea of, uh, broadly speaking, what most investors uh, will, will do, will look for. And you can see just on the left there, the initial meeting. And that is very much that, that first, you know, perhaps coffee or meeting at their office to present the idea. Um, before this, it's important to note, and again, we'll come back to this uh, in a bit, there is the, the, there's the pitch in terms of the teaser document or the business plan. So um, you have to whet their appetite with enough of, a, um, of an idea of what you're, what you're presenting before you even get to a stage of seeing them, meeting them face to face. But when you do, uh, very often it's an initial relatively informal meeting it then may be followed up by a number of questions on your on your business plan on some of the scrutinizing some of the numbers and then it starts to go through um, some further uh, due diligence i would say that the basic analysis and the due diligence on the right uh, morph into then where, where you really you, you have them on the hook they're interested um, they haven't necessarily made a uh, an offer yet but they're looking to do some in-depth due diligence analysis on the numbers, um, probably on the team, checking out that you know the experience all, all tallies uh, with what, what you know what you've all done in the past, um, and, and really starting to flex test um, whether this is indeed a, a business which is likely to succeed in the longer term. Um, look at the competitor analysis, all of those kind of things which are important. Um, it then may go, in this case, this is what, again, this is more of an institutional approach to a partner meeting. A partner meeting is typically an investment committee, whether it be debt or equity, where um, a partner might say, look, I, I met these guys, they're really impressive, we've done our due diligence, um, and I would like to propose this as an investment for the fund to make. Um, if it's a high net worth individual, an angel investor, you wouldn't you wouldn't necessarily have this kind of elongated process. You would it would be a typically a far uh, a far quicker decision because that individual controls the purse strings of what they invest into. But ultimately, that is the stage, whether it be a high net worth or an in, a, or a fund, that they say yes or no. And hopefully, it's a yes. And after that is when the term sheet is is written up. Typically, prior to the term sheet, um, you might negotiate a verbally what terms would be uh, would be relevant. Um, term sheets drawn up, um, all being well, it then goes to legals and any additional due diligence before money is drawn down into the business. Um, so I think the, you know, there are a few other things aside from this uh, from this slide. Um, Typically at this seed stage, there's little to go on in terms of provenance, of traction, of revenues. And so, you know, it falls on the investor to, there's a lot of speculation in terms of how 
uh, successful that business will be. And so um, the type of investors that typically get involved at that early stage um, may not do uh, as much due diligence as they might do for a later stage business. And then the due diligence that they do do is by its very nature much more speculative uh, in the in the longer term success of the business because you know it may have only been trading for a few months or a year and so I think that's that's something else to bear in mind that that the due diligence process may well take a lot longer um, the more mature the business um, but there are other things like um, you know they will ask what experience the team has they will they'll pull through that um, have you put any money into the business yourself um, there's the expression bootstrapping a business and that's where you you um, you fund it yourself to get to a stage of, of operating um, have you shown proof of concept so does have you shown that the actual business works um, have you you know performed a case study do you have any contracts in place um, and and I think you know all, though all of those things are, are, are things to consider um, but it's a Again, it's a, it's a difficult stage to raise capital at the beginning, but um, it's all about speaking to the right people and being prepared and, and passionate. You did say it does take uh, time and effort, and now I understand why. So many uh, elements to, to come together. Absolutely. Um, and I think the other thing, Desi, is really, you know, put yourself in the shoes of, of an investor. What questions would you ask a business if you um, you know, if you were faced with a business that statistically in the grand scheme of things was 90%, you know, had a 10% chance of success, what, what questions are you going to, are going to ask of them? Um, you know, obviously you're going to scrutinize the, the numbers, the financials, um, you're going to look at the team, um, but you also want to know, hey, I'm going to put in X amount of money, when am I going to realize that when am i going to get it out when when am i going to see profitability um some of the tax schemes which we'll come on to in a bit are set up that they help the investor write off some of their personal income tax but it does mean that they have to hold that investment in business for at least two or three years and so this is not a flash in the pan um you know investment where they're going to suddenly tomorrow sell their shares for much more they're in this for several years and so they need to you need to show them clear visibility of uh, an exit route um and i think that's you know that's quite often overlooked in you know businesses startup level think oh we just need to raise the money and then we'll worry about that further down the line but you know put yourself and shoot in the shoes of the investor um, and that's obviously a very important factor very good advice um so earlier I heard you mention about SCIS. Um, can you tell us what this is and how relevant it is in these situations? Absolutely. Um, I think there's a slide. Um, yeah, absolutely. So this slide gives you a, a kind of bird's eye view of um, on the right SCIS, which stands for the Seed Enterprise Investment Scheme and its big brother the enterprise investment scheme on the left and really what this is is uh, a incentive by the uk government to uh, encourage people and, and funds etc to invest in early stage businesses domiciled in the uk and uh, it does that by allowing let's say i was to put in uh, into seis which is set up for seed businesses that are under two years old it allows me to write off 50 percent of um of, of that amount so income tax relief so if i put in a hundred thousand pounds i think seis is capped at one hundred and fifty thousand uh, pounds it would allow me to immediately um claim back fifty thousand so my risk capital uh, on the face of it is is fifty thousand pounds even though i'm putting in um a uh, hundred so I, I claim back 50 there are then all sorts of other uh, incentives there's no capital gains that means when you sell it after the two years um, I'm not taxed on any profit that I might make um, and again reinvestment relief 
loss relief. So actually, once you add all of these things up and aggregate them, I think it works out that something like a, I think you're risking something like 27p in the pound. I might be a, a penny or two off, but broadly speaking. So you can understand it's a very, uh, it's a very attractive incentive for investors. Um, and the EIS, to touch on that briefly, that's for much larger uh, investments, um, several million uh, investments, but that you can only claim back 30%, um, still very attractive um, and similar, similar additional reliefs there too. So I think for something like this, it's really important that a startup business, um, probably more relevantly for startups is SEIS, the Seed Enterprise Investment Scheme, that they know about it and they know the basics. Um, you know, if you go into the business, uh, into a pitch, and the investor says, or oh, have you applied for the seed enterprise investment scheme? And you have no idea what they're talking about. <clears throat> it doesn't necessarily look very good. So it's, it's knowing about things. You have to look at it from both sides. You know, how is this going to appeal to the, to the investor? Um, not just as a business case, but also financially. Um, does this does this does this warrant applying for SEIS or indeed any other grants? You know, there's all sorts of grant funding from the government and elsewhere, um, and it all helps. So I think this is certainly something which is overlooked by by some people, but is is um, hugely important. Definitely. If you have never heard of this, definitely research, look into it, because it does uh, seem like a very important part of uh, the conversation with investors. Um, so, Hugo, if we were to take more a practical approach and talk about what uh, is expected when a business produces their financial statements? What figures do they need to show? What is important for an investor to see in terms of numbers? Absolutely. So if we pop onto slide six, this is just a, a startup cash flow template, but it gives you a, a snapshot of um, <clears throat> income expenditure. Obviously, that any, any financial uh, forecast would need to be uh, broader than this, but this is a good starting point because it very kind of crudely it, it shows what are your what your income is and what your expenditure is and then of course you can start to work out uh, what your forecasts are as you as you move forward for a business that's been trading for you know at least three years an investor would expect last three years and, and the next three years for a startup business um, nine times out of ten we'll see um, a hockey stick um, uh, uh, kind of picture uh, and what I mean by hockey stick is well the business doesn't really know what they're going to make but nine times out of ten surprise surprise they think they, they think they're going to be the best thing since sliced bread they're going to make billions of dollars and pounds and therefore the you know the the curve goes zooming up and investors roll their eyes because it, it you know you see it every single time and obviously that doesn't exactly tally with the old 90% failure rate of startups, unfortunately. Um, so I think there's a there's a point here, just kind of taking a step back, it's really important to be sensible um, and confident but conservative when it comes to your uh, your forecasts. So let's say you you know you haven't even started trading yet, or you've started, you know, you've maybe done a couple of months. You it's very difficult because you're thinking, well, blimey, I don't know, you know, I don't have anything to go on in terms of, you know, what what we might turn over. But you have to, as best you can, show uh, the investor what, you know, what what growth you're you're planning to make in those first two to three years, and that will inform them that you you're either living on cloud cuckoo because you think you're you, you know you're going to make a lot more than than you might. Or that you're being sensible and actually you're showing, you know, maybe it might take two years to get to break even or longer, perhaps. Um, and I think very often um, investors are met with with business plans that are just, frankly, crazy, and it puts them off. Um, after lots of hard work and meetings, uh, it puts them off the business altogether because it shows that actually 
you know, the the the, the management team haven't really kind of put some sensible numbers into play here. Um, but any financial director worth that sort will um, come up with some comprehensive financials which show a, again a, a compelling but conservative analysis of um, looking at perhaps um, competitors, what have they done, how do you differentiate, differentiate yourself and therefore start to build some numbers on, on what you think is possible. But it is difficult, um, but I think you have to just try and be um, as, as clear and as conservative and confident as, as possible. Um, I think that was uh, everything to note on that one. Thank you. If uh, if anyone is getting a headache just looking at this slide, then you definitely need to work on your skills of reading, preparing, understanding these kind of uh, numbers, because this is literally the language of investment, isn't it? The numbers more than the words. It is. Uh, and, you know, I, that's right. And, and I think, you know, when you, when you, if and when a business gets to a stage of, uh, you know, of appealing to private equity funds or venture capital firms, very often they will go straight to the financials. I mean, any investor worth their salt is investing in the people. That's really important. Um, but uh, but it, you know, when you're when you're managing a big fund of other people's money, and they get their you know business plan comes through, they'll go straight through to the to the to the financials. They'll they'll look at what the the profit loss is and they'll you know i see this every day they'll either say it's too small it's too early stage before it's slightly frustrating but before even speaking to the founder to see if it's an interesting opportunity or not so understanding the financials and having a good grip on them is absolutely paramount um again it's difficult at that early stage but as the business starts to get traction as the revenues start to come through the business and the EBITDA hopefully starts to grow, um, you will have more um, credibility and gravitas to say, look, we've, we've done this, this is what we've, we've achieved. And off that basis and off that growth trajectory, we believe we can do this. And hopefully it's an upward curve rather than the, a downward one. Um, but it is important. So, Financials are obviously important, but other than the financial uh, side of things, what other considerations uh, should owners of startups uh, think about when they're actively pursuing raising capital? Absolutely. I think there's another slide for this one, um, slide seven. Um, so I think, um, you know, there are, so, there are several practical um, things to consider here. Um, obviously, the business plan, the numbers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, all, all the kind of the documentation needs to be in order, and you need to know it like the back of your hand. But and I touched on this earlier. You have to be prepared that this process is not going to be, uh, unless you're very lucky, it's not going to be a quick process. Um, it typically takes at least three to four months, sometimes a lot longer. And you have to be prepared that it's going to take you away from the day-to-day -day running of your business. And, um, you know, you need to make sure that there are other people, other people within the team who can cover your responsibilities. And um, it, it's absolutely paramount, paramount in tandem with that, that the business plan that you pre present is clear, concise and that you are delivering it in a way which you know you know what you're talking about. Um, it's, it seems like an obvious thing to say, but um, you know, very often you're you're pitching to lots of different people. Um, and you know, over time the same questions can come up, but um, very often you know new new questions come about. So it's that preparedness again is absolutely key. Um, but just making making sure that you understand that you are going to be spending time away from the day-to-day -day running of your business and uh, it's yeah, it, it can take several months great thank you for that um i have a question around valuations um every time i watch uh, dragon's den or one of these investment programs all 
quite often I hear comments, oh, this is a ridiculous valuation. Oh, this is unrealistic valuation. Can you tell us how to be uh, go in front of an investor without presenting them a ridiculous valuation and how valuations work so that we are prepared? Yeah, I mean, I think um, valuations are a tricky one. It's very much a, it's very much an art art form or a science. And um, I mean, this this uh, uh, this slide here, you can see a couple of the things which are uh, important um, when investors look at any business. Um, you know, the the, the the top one, the Berkus model, <clears throat> look at things like you know, whether it's a sound idea, they look at the prototype, um, they look at you know, the team, the relationships and, uh, and the rollout uh, or the sales of the company. Um, but there are a number of different ways and you can, you can see them here that um, a, uh, a business will be able to build up a valuation. Of course, again, looking at this as a, in a startup scenario, it's really tricky because you have probably have no turnover to base your multiple on very often you know valuations that are on multiples um and therefore you have to say you have to look at what assets you have within the business and try and quantify them and what i mean by that is well what do you what do you own i mean very few startups own bricks and mortar property or inventory um if it's a technology business, for example, there might be some um, IP, some intellectual property that can be valued. Um, notwithstanding that, there are, you know, there's the there's the team, you know, that that's a value. So um, there are other things like, you know, do you have any contracts with with anyone? That's value. Anything that you can effectively throw into the pot which will, in the eyes of the investor, say, okay, that's, it's not just a bit of paper and a dream, but actually it's a really credible management team. They have, you know, perhaps a, a couple of contracts with um, some providers to, to, to show proof of concept. Um, they put in a bit of their own money, perhaps some, some money from family and friends. And, you know, they've, they've spent a good six months, maybe a year, um, putting this together. Um, perhaps they have a good database of, of clients. So all of these things count towards um, evaluation. And of course, and I've touched on this before, it's how that business differentiates itself to other competitors. Um, you might hear the expression barrier to entry. So really what that means is if I see a good idea, um, if I've got enough money just to replicate it, then how easy would it be for me to do that? and effectively price them or buy them out of the market by, or barge them out of the market by creating a competitive business, which is just larger than them. Um, so I think there are certain things here to, to consider. Um, and again, it's not, a, you know, it is an art form. It's a bit like a mortgage on a house or some other assets. It's what someone will pay for it. Um, and so nearly always, certainly at that early stage, it's a negotiation on um, uh, on uh, on the valuation. Of course, there's that that um, uh, that question of how much capital you want to be raising. Perhaps come back to that in a second. Um, but you know, you want to be giving away enough to that investor uh, that it makes sense for them. And similarly, you want to be understanding how much value they're going to be adding back to the business itself. And we're coming back to that point earlier in the webinar. Um, but I think any accountant or RFD will be able to um, guide you through this process um, and uh, come, come to a valuation which is not um, completely crazy. There are, again, it's a bit like the hockey stick analogy on, on forecasts. There are startup businesses that come up with frankly, ludicrous valuations. And um, it's not even sometimes based on what someone has put money in previously for, it's just because they think they're worth you know, 10 million pounds when they've not done any, any trading. And so um, that can be very off-putting and can show that they think they're perhaps a bit too big for their boots. And of course, the, the, the challenge or the, the, you know, let's just say a business managed to raise some money on a 10 million valuation, which is, you know, has happened. 
the, they then need to retain and, and sustain that growth trajectory so that if and when, which is likely, they do another round, maybe a pre, you know, a, a series A round, for example, of raising, you know, five, 10 million pounds, that, that growth trajectory needs to be sustained, that, that they don't have to do a down round because if the company doesn't shoot the lights out and be then, then be worth 20 million, well, then they're going to have to, you know, they, they're at risk of having to do a down round and no, no shareholder wants that because it means their, their shares aren't worth as much. So it's a, it's, it's finding the right, finding the right balance, striking the right balance on, on, um, on, on what the company is worth and the assets that, that lie within it, which is, which is key. Not a straightforward answer. <laughs> In other words, <laughs> lots to yeah. consider. Um, yeah. So if you go, um, we have some really interesting questions from our attendees, but before I turn to them, I have one final uh, question for you from my side. Um, now that we've understood the process and what are the key elements in um, raising successfully um, capital for your business, can you give us um, a, an example of someone who has done that already, someone who uh, demonstrates all the right steps in order to be successful. Sure. I think um, just as a prelude to that, if we could skip back to slide number two, um, I think just a few additional comments on raising capital, and then I can give, kind of give you an example. Um, I think it's really important that, um, and this tallies very much with the last point that I was talking about, is finding that balance of how much you need to raise for a business. Cause that's, you know, alongside the valuation, it's really important, you know, do you raise 10,000, half a million, a million? The general rule of thumb I think is more or less right is try and raise the amount that you think will take you through to a break even scenario. Um, as we've already touched on, raising capital is, is quite an arduous process. It can take, um, it can take many months, and if you're continually raising what what are called top up rounds, because you've run out of money and you, your cash burn is quite high, you've taken on more team members. Um, that's not a place you want to be because again, you're not focusing on your business; you're focusing on raising capital. So I think if you can, um, perhaps not at that pre seed stage, but maybe at seed or or Series A stage, try and raise the amount that you think you forecast will get you through to, to break even. And um, better to raise a larger amount than lots of small amounts and be looking to raise money all the time. Um, again, understand the relevance of FDIS and EIS in tandem with that. So um, those two tax incentives both have caps on the amount that you can raise. So that might inform you a little bit in terms of what you want to raise. Um, and also, of course, be mindful of what you give away in equity. So how much of the company you're giving away to an investor. Um, they are taking the most risk. So you need to be mindful of that. Um, but you also need to be mindful of the fact that uh, if you give away too much, you are going to be diluted as a founder of the business. And if and when, and very likely most businesses do, you raise a series A, B, larger amounts of money, you do not want to be in a position where you're giving away too much equity right at the start of your journey to then be diluted to potentially even a minority position in your company where you're completely disincentivized and you're, you're effectively bought out of your own company. That's of course what you, you don't want. And investors don't want that because they're investing in a CEO who's not incentivized because they don't own a majority share of their own business. So um, I think there are a few a few things to, to weigh up there. Um, and um, I think just coming on to your example, Desi, I mean, I, I mentioned uh, just over 10 years ago, I used to run startup events. It's a little bit like Dragon's Den or Shark's Tank. And, um, you know, there were businesses. I remember one particular uh, pitching event where there was a, all of them were startups, but there was a business that, um, on paper was far lower risk. They put in quite a lot of money into the business. Um, it was run by a group of gentlemen who had 
a very good experience. It was a fintech business. Um, and they presented, but they presented with, um, frankly, a complete lack of charisma and passion. And they were followed by a, um, a, a business, I think, that made iced tea. It was pretty high risk, to say the least. Um, but the founders, um, a guy and a girl, was so full of passion that they would make this succeed that they got the funding that they looked for and the other guys didn't. And from that point on, it, it really proved and hammered the hope the point to me that having, of course, you've got to have a business which is deliverable and credible, but having that enthusiasm that you are going to do everything possible to deliver for the shareholder and make them a profit, it goes such a, such a long way and it really can't be underestimated. And that was, um, you know, they, they had in, on that on that day, they had such a good reception from the room and, and, and actually were oversubscribed in terms of what they were looking for. So um, I think that's just a, a, you know, a valid point to remember. Great. Thank you for all your um, words and uh, wisdom and advice that uh, you've given us today. Uh, before I move on to the participants' questions, um, I'd like to put on your screen a couple of questions from us, from Hugo and myself, to see whether you have uh, really understood what this webinar is about, whether you everything we've tried to um, give you some information has actually made sense so my our first question should be now uh, popping out on your uh, screen where you should be able to vote and um, the question is statistically what percentage of startups in the uk will ultimately fail so if you've been listening you should uh, be able to answer this fairly easily i think Hugo repeated it several times um, and I can see some uh, answers coming back. I'm going to give you a few more seconds to uh, log your uh, answers and ideas. Okay. Uh, any more votes? Bring them in. And I'll close this uh, particular poll. And yes, most of you are right that uh, yes, 90% uh, are likely to not succeed. So um, that was uh, a good result. Uh, let's now ask you our second question, um, which you should be able to see now on your screen. And the question is, uh, what percentage of income tax can an investor claim back from SEIS, equity investment? Can you remember what uh, that percentage was? I can see your answers coming in. I'll give you a few more seconds for those of you who haven't had a chance to answer yet. Okay. So here we have the results, a bit of a, a, a split. So Hugo, can you please confirm once again, what is the correct answer? 50%. So I think most people got it right, it looks things. That's right. A few did think it's less, but good news then, it's more than what you thought. <laughs> and the last question that uh, we have for you, which you should be able to see now on your screens, uh, which of the following may not be a typical investor for a seed stage startup? Where should you not be considering immediately at the beginning of your journey? Let us know what you think. Your answers are coming in. Ok. 
great and i will close the poll now and 73 percent of you think a private equity fund is that right hugo perfect yeah absolutely very good that's great news um so I have a few, uh, I will read that, I will choose a couple of questions um, from our audience. And um, if you could just give us a quick, um, a quick answer. Uh, we have a question here, which says, what sort of collateral is normally required when you negotiate to secure funding? Would you ever be, uh, would it ever be as extreme as we need your house as a collateral mm. where do we stand on collateral so collateral um typically is really only required when you're looking at a debt transaction um when you are investing equity into uh, into a business you are in return what you're getting is shares in the business when you are offering up collateral or security, as it's often known, you are offering, um, you're, you're typically seeking a debt arrangement. Um, so if you, and, and typically startups will not have sufficient collateral to apply for debt. So you might, you might be looking, um, you know, let's say you might be looking for a million pounds. Most startups, um, don't have turnover, let alone property, which the company structure owns. But when they get further down the line, perhaps in two or three years time, um, you know, maybe a food, a food business, for example, where they, they lease the factory, but they own some of the machinery, then you might have, to, you might start to have some assets, physical assets, which you can offer up that you own, don't lease, that you can offer up as a security. Um, I would never in a million years suggest that anyone puts their house up as security um, against, you know, a business unless in, in exceptional circumstances, but generally speaking, don't do that. Um, but what I think we're getting at here is, is when you're raising debt um, or a convertible loan note. A convertible loan note is where you, you, you are, um, an investor is, is puts in X amount of money into a business they receive a percentage, a bit like a loan, but it, it allows the contract allows them to convert that the debt that they've invested into an equity position within a fixed period. And especially in times like these during the uh, COVID crisis, uh, many equity investors have gone to ground. They're, they're, they're not investing because um, Typically, equity investment obviously is the longer term play at the moment with a huge level of uncertainty. They're just not investing. But debt investors are because if there's sufficient security, either property or inventory, um, or you can lend against cash flow. So let's say a business has a good amount of profitability, typically at least half a million. Then you can your security is that the company is making enough profit, and if it all goes up the spout, if it goes wrong, then um, the company may offer what's called a debenture, which means that you, as an investor, can um, can effectively claim you have first charge. You can claim claim on the company itself. Um, so I think the, that question is 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 tailored more towards a, a debt or convertible loan note. Um, deal great thank you uh we have another question is can you recommend a crowdfunding platform suitable for pre-seed funding is there anyone that maybe stands out for you um uh no <laughs> um, <laughs> well i mean there are some very big i'm personally a little bit skeptical of crowdfunding sites because um they they very often require let's say you're raising um a million pounds they require you to raise half a million from your existing shareholders before they even put you on their site they charge you for that half a million that you've raised from your own investors the fees are quite high um and you th there's zero strategic value from from the investors you know 
Mr. and Mrs. Miggins from somewhere in the in the countryside who will never meet you and they don't know anything about your business. They just think it's a good idea because they saw saw it online. Um, I'm slightly deviating because I'm skeptical about crowdfunding, but there are, you know, they have had um, a number of successes. There have been businesses which have raised capital very, very quickly. Um, and I think that by and large crowdfunding sites now are a lot better at what they do because the barrier to entry of which businesses they allow onto their sites is much higher. Whereas I think a couple of years ago, it was slightly you know, a free for all and um, the old guard of finance was um, a lot, lot more skeptical of them. Um, so in terms of sites, the ones I know of, uh, and I'm not sure when, when you say precede, whether that would qualify for them or not, but Crowdcube is a very well well known one, started in Exeter. Um, Cedars, S E S W E D R S, uh, and Syndicate Room are some of the perhaps three and three and perhaps best better known ones in the UK. Again, I'm not entirely sure whether they would accept a kind of pre-seed, um, but uh, but possibly possibly worth looking into. Thank you. And one final question, which has come from a few of the participants. Um, this is something partially I could answer is we do have um, the question was, do we have a course that would uh, teach this in more in depth if someone wants to spend more time learning these topics? And yes, we do have a course. Um, Hugo Chance is in fact the one that will be delivering it. Uh, but maybe um, if I could give you the opportunity to tell a little bit more uh, about what such course would cover so people have an idea. Absolutely. Well, you can see here um, some of the learning objectives that the course will cover, um, and some of them are quite self-explanatory. But I think overarching all of this is, and hopefully from what this last hour has, has demonstrated, is there are both you know, um, there are practical considerations to, to consider um, when raising capital for your business. There are a number of things which are very easy to gloss over, but then will come back to bite you if you're not prepared for them. Um, everything from the nuances of how to um, interact and speak to a private investor compared to an institutional one, um, right down to, you know, how long does a business plan need to be? I've seen business plans which are five pages i've seen business plans which are 50. personally i think no longer than 15 pages what else do you need teasers what's in a teaser um you know all of these things and more are absolutely imperative and frankly speaking i think unfortunately the reason we see such a high degree and high percentage of failure um in startups is because of the lack of that preparedness um and again, I think this this course is is a um, a very useful opportunity for anyone to really go through in detail um, each stage of what they need to understand, what they need to learn, and, and frankly, what they need to be prepared for before they even think about um, going and speaking to investors. Um, and I think there's it's it's hugely impressive if, in the eyes of an investor, if someone uh, is interacting with them and someone they meet that has everything prepped and ready they're confident they are credible um, and they have all the answers to the questions they have a good team behind them um, and very rarely you know very very rarely people have all of those things and i think so i think condensing that you know all of these all of these headers here um, aggregate that preparedness um, so I think it's, it's absolutely imperative. Thanks, Hugo. And just um, to wrap up for everyone who is interested in knowing more, um, I'm just going to quickly switch between the slides. You should be able to see slightly different slides now. Um, last month, uh, we started with a webinar on starting a business, how to start a business post-COVID. And I gave you a few ideas of what courses within LSBF executive education you can do in order to start planning, thinking, and 
um, getting your ideas together. And today we have covered the next most important topic, which is the finance side of starting and running and growing your business. Uh, so raising finance for your business is one of the core courses that we have on this topic, together with some other ones, for example, um, accounting for performance and control is the one that will give you basic skills as to how to prepare the budget that we saw earlier and how to read financial statements. Um, and you can spend a long time learning that, but putting it all together, um, raising finance for your business is the one that puts all the skills and topics we have covered today. And next month, we will continue the webinar series, um, focusing more on the marketing side of um, the entrepreneur journey. How do you go to market? How do you find your clients? Uh, then that will be followed by skills as to how you sell, um, selling uh, to prospective customers, which requires different set of skills. And finally, how to grow your business, which again comes back to today's topic, because it's not just uh, a matter of starting, but also um, growing, because it's it's no point starting and staying small if uh, you're going to put so much time and effort into something that you love. So what I wanted to share with you is that um, the course Raising Finance for Your Business is due to start in the second week of September for eight weeks. It will run on Wednesday evenings for eight consecutive weeks. Um, however, if you wanted to do a little bit of studying before, we have a couple of a few courses starting in July on various other topics that you may be interested uh we will have a break in august as i suspect most of you would be uh taking some holiday and time off uh, but once you come back in september you can spend eight evenings with hugo chance understanding from a practical point of view what does it what you need to know in order to raise uh, finance this is not an academic course where you will be sitting and reading articles and learning theories you will be going through real life such situations and learning practical skills um, along the way so put this date in the diary and um, get in contact with us so that we can add you to the cohort the application process is really really simple after this webinar most likely tomorrow uh, we will send you the recording of this webinar together with the slides um, you will be able to uh, watch this webinar as many times as you like, as you will have uh, the link to the recording. And if you respond to that email, I'm interested, we will be able to come back to you specifically with your inquiries, with your questions, and um, send you a link where you will be able to apply online for the course. You don't need to do lengthy paperwork you don't need to do more than five minutes of putting in your details in our system uh, saying which course you're interested and in, filling in the application form once we've got all your details you make a payment whether that's a deposit a partial deposit whether you want to set up a payment plan all of this will be explained and it will be given to you as information we have flexible payment plans where you can spread out uh, the payment for a few over a few months and we will set you up on that and finally you're ready to start so really really easy uh, not uh, more than five ten minutes of your time to get in contact with us and give us your details so that uh, we can set you up um, on the course um, as a special offer because you have stayed with us till the end of the uh, webinar you have listened intently you answered the questions really well um, if you book in the next week even if you put a deposit down we will be able to offer you a special 10 percent uh, discount uh, it should say additional 10 percent off if the word off is missing from the slide but if you're able to commit to this course in the next week uh, and for thanking you for your time and effort to be here we will give you that additional um, incentive um, i can see a few more questions have arrived since uh, we started speaking 
Um, what I will do after this, I will download all the questions and I will make sure that someone answers you directly. If it's a more technical question, we will ask you to go to give his view. If it's a more course related question, one of our program advisors will be in touch to answer those questions. Uh, please don't um, uh, think that we are ignoring you. We will be um, getting in contact with you. Uh, but by all means, if you think of further questions, let's say you've uh, gone away and you thought about what you've heard, send us an email and we will definitely address those um, in the next few days. So at this point, Hugo, I'd like to thank you very much for you. all your insights. Uh, is there anything you would like to say just to wrap up? I don't think so. I hope it's been uh, helpful and informative and um, I hope uh, if, if it has been that people would like to hear more and, and sign up for the course. But thank you very much for having me. You're very welcome. We'd love to have you. We'd love to work with people who are in the business, who are living this every day, who can give real life experiences. And this is what LSBF Executive Education is all about, giving you life skills, not just what you do while you're studying with us, but what you will do with your life after you finish with us and you're ready to tackle these problems in the real world. We hope that we're equipping you with all the skills for you to be successful. So thank you very much for all your time and attention and uh, please watch out for the email with the recording and the slides and um, we look forward to seeing you on the next webinar. We will let you know the date closer to the time. Uh, I suspect third week of July is when the next one will be happening, uh, but keep an eye on that. And thank you. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye.